I'd like to now bring um, to the stage two very exciting CEOs. Obviously, you guys know Omar Krasidis, founder and CEO of ArabNet, and Danish Farhan, CEO of Viche, uh, which is one of the knowledge partners for ArabNet. And they're going to talk about the launch of their report, State of Play, Artificial in Intelligence by Viche and ArabNet. Good afternoon. Is the microphone on? Fantastic. How many of you had more than half your fill for lunch today? Because that will determine the success of this presentation, <laughs> I think. <laughs> All right. Without further ado, this is a collaboration between Zeta Reports and ArabNet with the help of narratives, and we're super excited to share what we have discovered are the attitudes and perceptions of AI in the Middle East. My name is Danish Farhan. I'm Omar Christidis. Fantastic. With that, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with a quick story because presentations on their own with a ton of data traditionally put you to sleep in about three and a half minutes, our research proves. All right, so AI, most of us believe, was invented in 1956 as a term. But our research tells us that this predates us by about 3,000 years. Ancient Greece, there was mythology and, and a character called Daedalus, who's an inventor, who actually had built virtual assistants back in the day that helped serve the royal court. In ancient China, there was a courtesan who was a virtual uh, machine, a centennial uh, uh, machine that was way ahead of its time. And the king had a problem because this machine managed to impress all the concubines. So we have been <laughs> thinking about AI for a very, very long time. Why AI today? There's two very specific reasons for it. Number one, we are creating data at far greater a rate than carbon. Our data footprint is greater than our carbon footprint, and this is alarming. 90% of the world's data that exists today was created in the last two years alone. Number two is the nearly trillion-fold increase in processing power and storage capacity. Those two things have led us to where we are today. There's a lot of confusion around what is AI, what, what's machine learning, what's deep learning. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really use the word cat. Um, I understand that cats resonate with most people in the room. And the breakthrough for deep learning, which is unsupervised learning, was on the basis of a computer who was able to decipher what was in fact a cat image and a cat video without being taught that information. This was the breakthrough. Now let's move on to the age that we're living in. We have been talking about the dystopian vision of um, uh, general AI for a long time, since the 60s, but that hasn't happened. Siri ain't about to kill me. Um, and so we're really living in a time of narrow AI. AI that is fantastic at automating and roboticizing something that we as human beings do in one domain alone. But that doesn't mean that we're not collectively progressing. We have hundreds of thousands of these applications that all work in silos and collectively they make us more competitive and intelligent. General AI, uh, maybe the 30s, maybe the 40s, who knows? It's not really a priority for anybody except researchers and labs. And that tells you a lot about what we need as a market, what we need as decision makers and policy makers versus what researchers want to accomplish in a lab. Slight disparity. We're already living in an age of AI. Netflix tells us what movies to watch. Did you know that every single film has over 60 variations of the movie poster that shows up? And my Netflix profile is different from yours. I may resonate with close-ups, while you may resonate with a typography uh, poster. And so this is based on machine learning. Do you know that AI is conducting our conversations? Omar is going to talk about some of the research, but really interesting. Nearly 80% of people in the Middle East use predictive text to complete their sentences, often to some, some very funny um, uh, outcomes. Uh, I have another story. I, I once was a, at an airport in uh, a JFK, and I wanted to let my wife know that I was switching from Emirates to Etihad, and the text goes out, and I realize that it said, I'm going on jihad. Um, <laughs> I was petrified by that. I deleted it very quickly because autocorrect did not understand Etihad. <coughs> um, I hope nobody is, <laughs> is here from Etihad. Um, AI is managing our stock portfolios. Um, in the last few years alone, the top eight hedge funds 
have earned nearly $8, uh, $8 billion using robo-advisors. Commonplace, we have already been replaced in segments of our jobs. AI is deciding our politics. I don't need to get into details. But if any of you have watched the Senate hearings with Mark Zuckerberg, something that was quite alarming was how much Mark Zuckerberg underplayed the role of AI currently at play in Facebook. Every time he was asked, what is AI doing about understanding what is evil and what is bad, and how do you keep away from conversations that are socially destructive, he said, we will deploy AI. And this to me is quite alarming, because there have been statements that this has been deployed already. AI, for all its positivity, can also go wrong. I want to give you just one example. Um, about eight months ago, a research team in the United States decided to see how people behave when it comes to trust in robots. So there was a group of about 60 people who were told that they may be a fire, and in the case of a fire, you need to follow this robot to the safest exit. And so, lo and behold, there was smoke and there was fire, and everyone started to follow the robot. The robot, unknown to them, was designed to make a fool of itself. So it takes everybody into a dark room, and people go, I'm sure it knows what it's doing. It may just be a glitch, but it has far more data than we do. So they continue following the robot. Five minutes later, they end up in another room where the robot keeps hitting the wall and falls over, and people still had a predisposed amount of trust in robots. This is a challenge. We trust robots more than we do human beings, and we don't even realize it. OK, let's move on. Very quickly, AI, in our opinion, is progressing across three dimensions. This is really to, to make it very straightforward. Not two axes, but three axes. The first is computational. Anything that is logic-based is computational. The second is autonomous. Anything that can be roboticized or automated as a process is, 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 is autonomous. And the third is social. Something that can allow robots or machines or code to communicate with other people using some sort of a social framework. Most AI today does well across two dimensions. Very little AI does well across all three dimensions. And you see how AlphaGo, as well as um, um, uh, Watson, fares across that dimension. We believe that about two years ago, there was a Sputnik moment for AI. And let me tell you what that means. Do you remember back in the day with Kennedy, there was this massive arms race to conquer space? And that was because Russia got up and said, we're going to do this. We reached that point when AlphaGo defeated the reigning champion of Go and suddenly, the incredibly mobile Far East decided to wake up and double down on investment as well as uh, policy making when it comes to AI. And the United States and Europe started to lag. This led to two things. An arms race for weaponization of AI. It gives nations a competitive advantage. I'm not going to go into the, into the funding numbers. They're right there. It's quite sizable. Number two, an arm race, uh, arms race for market share. The next big uh, blue pill ain't going to come from iterative innovation. It's going to come from innovation that is spurred by deep learning and machine learning. And the contribution to GDP that's expected in the next seven or eight years alone is quite alarming. In the Middle East, and I'm going to invite Omar to come in from here, there is a nearly $1.2 trillion dirham opportunity that's emerging by 2030. And with that, Omar, take it yep. to you. Thank you, Danish. Right. And uh, it's exciting to see uh, AI be not just on uh, the top of the agenda of uh, Western and Eastern nations, but that uh, here in the UAE, the UAE itself has taken a very ambitious view to be uh, one of the top, if not the global leader, the first country to really assign a minister of artificial intelligence. And so with this interest in artificial intelligence, we thought nobody has really asked the citizens what they think about artificial intelligence, right? Uh, are they afraid? Are they apprehensive? Are they excited? Or do they think it's going to be a benefit or a cost? And so what we did is we ran the first consumer behavior survey of 1,000 people across five countries and asked people their opinions about artificial intelligence. And we're going to be giving you here a sneak peek uh, of the statistics that we've done. Uh, we're working further on finalizing the report. We're uh, uh, going to be diving into a few uh, topics further. And we will be doing a full launch, so you'll be able to download all the content. But now a sneak peek at the findings of our research. Uh, the UAE, as we mentioned, is really leading AI preparedness. And they want to be doing AI across all government entities. We've seen this uh, from police to DIWA uh, to the RTA. So is the Middle East really ready for artificial intelligence? 
our research finds that 61% of the people that we surveyed uh, believe that AI is going to uh, really be a positive impact for them and their lives. Uh, and interestingly enough, it is uh, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia that believe this the most, and the UAE that is the most apprehensive about the impact of technology. And when we compare this with the next slide, who's aware of, of AI the most, who really understands it, right? We see that the UAE, the country that is most apprehensive about artificial intelligence, also the country uh, that is most aware about it, whereas Saudi Arabia is lagging in terms of awareness and understanding of AI, tends to have a more positive outlook uh, on AI, perhaps a, a kind of inverse correlation here. When we look at what do people actually use AI and what do they understand as AI, so the top part of this is people uh, understanding that these things are AI, and the bottom part is people using these on a regular basis. And so if you look at the top, uh, beyond the ones on the right which are colored, if you look at the highest numbers, so what people perceive as AI are really the kind of complex futuristic things, right? So self-driving cars or smart home devices uh, or even image recognition like the cat that Danish was talking about. Uh, versus uh, what they use all the time is things around text prediction, uh, purchasing recommendations, and movie and music recommendations. But while these are really artificial intelligence, these score some of the lowest on in terms of uh, people really thinking that they are AI. So a lot of people in the Middle East are engaging with artificial intelligence, but not really aware that what they're doing is artificial intelligence, or at least don't ascribe to this uh, the nature of being artificial intelligence. Uh, if we look at frequency of use, certainly uh, traffic predictions, text predictions, and movie and music predictions are the most common uh, uses. Uh, but we are starting to see more people uh, using both uh, purchase predictions as well as chatbots. And chatbots have been a major topic of discussion throughout the conference, whether in, uh, in marketing in the purchase funnel, whether it's in uh, the world of finance and in customer acquisition. So uh, this is a, a huge uh, opportunity moving forward. Which industries will benefit from AI? Well, uh, the largest benefit will really go to the ICT industry in manufacturing. But again, people expect that finance and healthcare will be really improved through artificial intelligence. Uh, and we can imagine this whether it's through uh, robots helping us manage our money better because <laughs> we are not really that great at it or uh, uh, ro uh, artificial intelligence helping us understand and uh, diagnose our illnesses. And uh, if we jump to the next chart, really, uh, what, no, it's the one after. So I'm going to continue here. We look at finance and healthcare are two of the highest in terms of real impact uh, and benefit from AI. And insurance, interestingly enough, uh, tends to score lower, even though yesterday uh, in our conversation with, uh, with Sadi Hindi from Takaful Imarat, we understood that AI is going to be used tremendously in this space, whether it's fraud detection, whether it's uh, pricing of risk. So, uh, but still consumers don't perceive that this is going to be a uh, big benefit. What are the types of benefits that con consumers will get from AI? They're around safety, lifestyle, and improvement in business. And the number one factor that comes up is decreasing accidents and mistakes at work and performing dangerous tasks. And then aligned with our previous conversation about the importance of AI in healthcare, we saw that 53% of people said that they expect medical advances that improve their lives through artificial intelligence. This is also the, uh, the benefit that they are most interested in. Uh, so people are really looking at uh, how, uh, th or they're really prioritizing metal di medical diagnosis as the most interesting and relevant for them. But in addition to this, there are uh, things around autonomous vehicles and food waste. And in the UAE in particular, 43% uh, are really excited about the potential of AI to address climate change. What's the time frame of AI? I think uh, uh, if we look at this, we see three clusters. About one third of people believe that it'll be within five years. That's pretty, pretty soon. Uh, another 30% or another third believe that it's about uh, 10 years. And then about a third see this as a really distant time horizon. So that's 20 years or not in my lifetime or AI is science fiction, people who believe that this will never happen. But it is quite amazing that uh, uh, almost two thirds of people that believe that AI will have a drastic impact on our lives within the next five to 10 years. Okay, 
I'm going to leave you with one stat. So you remember I was telling you that AI has not really graduated to becoming a national priority for most developed countries of the world. China was the first country to look at a consolidated way for the entire nation to address AI. Um, the UAE is a speck of dust on the map, and it has challenged the notion of where AI takes uh, the lead and where AI follows us in order to enhance what we're already doing well as a competitive nation. Uh, two and a half weeks ago, France launched their AI strategy. So the landscape is quite limited, and therefore, this is a brilliant greenfield. We believe that today, the role of policymakers, as well as investors, in the Middle East is critical to defining how AI will play a role in the future of cities. With that, Omar and I, thank you very much for your time. This report will be out soon. Yes, and, uh, and a, a, a shameless plug, uh, both uh, Arabnet and Zishi, or Zishi and Arabnet, uh, both deliver a tremendous uh, number of reports with real insights and localized insights about the market. Uh, you can download reports from both of our websites, uh, so make sure to check them out. Uh, Zisha has a great report that they've done on blockchain. Uh, we've done a range of reports on investment and e-commerce and smart cities. Uh, so we encourage you to uh, come and talk to us about our research, download our research, and uh, benefit from uh, the insights that we're developing. Thank you. Thank you again.